Okay, so here we are with Augustine. And uh, today what we want to do is we want to make our way through books eight and nine. So I just have a few things that I want to say. And I want to begin with some general pointers for reading Augustine. Uh, the first of these, and I'm, I'm reading from some notes that I, that I have, that I've given myself. First of all, I want you simply to enjoy him. And I want you to know that you are reading him for yourself. Whatever the baggage, whatever the differences between our time and his time, we are reading Augustine for ourselves. There's something about that that no one can take away from you. And uh, that can be quite liberating. So I want you to uh, j just embrace, em embrace that and enjoy the fact that you are reading him for yourself. Secondly, it doesn't take long to realize that you are in the presence of a great mind. So whatever else rhetoric can mean, it doesn't mean something separable from a quality of thoughtfulness. And I think simply to recognize the, the sheer intensity of what he is thinking and the way that he's thinking uh, is, is something worth experiencing uh, for, it, for itself. Third sort of general point uh, as we get started with Augustine. Try, and I think I said this before uh, in the first lecture, try not to get caught up in an intellectual debate with Augustine or, or uh, use as a criterion the notion of whether he proves his points. Put the emphasis rather rhetorically on inhabiting his prose, inhabiting the world of his text, entering into his imaginative unfolding of, of what he sees around him. Okay, so those are the, the three points that um, I hope that you're able to, uh, to apply um, in your in your thinking about in your thinking about Augustine. So in your in your journal entries, then uh, if you see that you're using the word or tempted to use the word proof or proves this point, something like that, uh, I'd encourage you to find a way to rephrase or rethink what it is that you're what, that you're trying to engage with at that at that point. Okay, so first of all, just on that quality of mind. Uh, the second of my three points there. Um, think about it is precision. Here's an early place where I think we, we encounter that quality of mind. And I'm looking at uh, book eight. It's um, chapter one. And it is subsection two. That's the way to refer to uh, Augustine. So if you were putting this in writing, it would be 8.1.2. I'll sometimes cheat and give you the page number as well, but don't give the page number when you uh, when you quote them in your journals or if you cite them in a, an essay or, uh, or 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 in the midterm. Uh, just use uh, book, chapter, and section bracketed number. So in 8.1.2 on page five, um, just note the note the precision of the way that he talks. For we say that in this Trinity, two or three persons are not greater than one alone. Our carnal perception cannot grasp this because it only perceives as it can the true. And then the editor has added that thing in square brackets or real, just to clarify what the word true means to Augustine. Uh, the true things that are created, but is unable to discern the truth itself by which they have been created. If it could do so, then that very corporeal light itself would be in no way more clear than this that we have just said, blah, 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 blah. So you, you can just sense that he is pursuing an idea that is complex, that is subtle, and you know that he's taking it on. You know that he's going to guide you through it. Maybe you won't agree with him. 
that's really not the point. The point is that we recognize that we're in the presence of a serious thinker. It has been said that uh, if all philosophy is a footnote to Plato, then all theology is a footnote to Augustine. So we just want to just want to recognize that 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 we're uh, we're in the game here. We're in amongst the balls, as they say in snooker, uh, with uh, someone who is is seriously thinking. Here's just another example of that in um, eight two three. So book eight, chapter two, section three, which begins on page six. And I want to draw your attention to a long sentence. So this is the second paragraph on page six. And if we try to think of the Trinity, insofar as he allows and grants, let no one think of any kind of contact or embrace in space or in place as though there were three bodies, nor of any needing together of a joint, as the fable relates of the three-bodied Geryon. Let us reject what whatsoever may occur to the mind that is of such a sort, as to be greater in three than in each one singly, and less in one than in two. For in this way, everything corporeal is rejected. You know, that, that's a long sentence. <laughs> I suppose the first thing I'd want to say is don't try this at home. Uh, <laughs> um, go ahead. There are places where you want to experiment with this in your, in your papers and, and, and in your writing. Uh, just know that long sentences can very easily become unwieldy. The, the fact that this sentence hangs together, we'll, we'll, we'll trust the Latin, we have the English version, but it, it hangs together. Challenge, no doubt, for the translator. But the fact that it hangs together is itself a sign of someone who is in control of their rhetoric, of someone who is thinking sharply. And uh, I, I just give that to you as, uh, as an indication uh, the kind of quality of mind that you're dealing with uh, when you're reading Augustine. Now, uh, let's think about sustained thought as a rhetorical exercise. Here's another example of a long sentence, and this is from 834, so just over the page on page 7. Here's another example. Am I going to read this for you? Uh, no, I'm not going to read the whole sentence because the whole sentence takes the whole of the paragraph that begins chapter 3. So you can read it for yourself. But if you look at it, you see that what he's talking about is the notion of the good. Uh, the notion of the good. I'll start it. Certainly you, you love only the good because the earth is good by the height of its mountain the moderate elevation of its hills and the evenness of its fields and good is the farm that is pleasant and fertile and good is the house that is arranged etc 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 so one question that should come to mind when you're thinking rhetorically is why why write such a long sentence why is this sentence here and the question that you're asking is what does form have to do with content. Now, even to ask that question and to think that that's a meaningful question is already to enter into the ontotheological synthesis and a participatory way of thinking about the universe. If rhetorical form is connected to content, then it's not as though the form itself is something that is a purely manipulable thing. Again, think the contrast rhetorically between symbol and sacrament. A symbol understood in a nominalistic kind of way is something that is purely manipulable. But if language is sacramental in some sense, has a mysterious belonging to that which it describes, then it makes sense that form would be connected to content. So just to ask the question is important, and it is an important question to ask. Why write a long sentence? Why now? Why in this context? Well, 
He loves good things. And the length of the sentence illustrates that there's lots of good stuff. There's lots of stuff that he enjoys, that he takes pleasure in. There is, we'll go further here, there is an abundance of goodness. Now that suggests a world that is rich in good things, that is even mysteriously rich in good things. We're back to the Hopkins quote, charged with the grandeur of God. Notice where this, notice where this goes. Notice what happens in the next paragraph after this extremely long sentence. Why should I add still more? <laughs> in other words, he could. He could add more because moreness is implicit in what he has already said. Note too the shortness of that sentence. Note the brevity of that which in a way doesn't break up the moreness that he's just been talking about and simply collects the mind to, you know, to, to agree with, with, with where he's going. And then look at what happens after that. This good and that good, take away this and that and see good itself if you can. So you will see God who is good, not by another good, but is the good of every good. That's another definition of participation, right? So the goodness of things co-inheres or belongs to the good itself. So why write a long sentence about goodness? Because rhetorically, he wants you there. He wants you to inhabit his prose and to inhabit a worldview that makes you think, that invites you to think, not just about this good or that good, but about goodness itself. So rhetorically, I think it's, it's quite brilliant. Okay, here's a, here's a different kind of uh, rhetorical example. And again, it's very interesting for, for the content that it's connected with. Uh, the example that I want to talk about here is negation. So I want to go, I want to go back just a little bit. Now, let me introduce this by saying that negation is a, a terribly important philosophical concept. It's the concept of otherness. You run across this all the time in postmodern thought, and it's terribly important for for thinking about Augustine. So to talk about, and not just Augustine, but talk about participatory thought, whether we're thinking of, um, you know, the Greek, the Ionian uh, notion of physis, the Greek notion of the cosmos, uh, the Roman notion of natura, um, thinking about participation in the divine uh, in, involves uh, this, uh, the, 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 uh, this this notion. So to talk about God is to talk about transcendence. And this implies humility. Not only about our intellectual um, our intel uh, um, sorry not not only to, not only when we're talking about our intellect, but when we're talking about the meaningfulness of our feelings and the power of our rhetoric, can we ex express the notion of God? And for Augustine, um, it's important to recognize that in some sense, God is other. This is very important for the tradition that Augustine influences. For him, limitation is built into our, our reality. So how does he convey this rhetorically? Okay, let's go back to book eight, chapter two, and section three.
But let's look at the second. Let's look at the second paragraph. If we try to think of the Trinity, insofar as He allows and grants, let no one think of any kind of contact or embrace in space or in place as though there were three bodies, nor of any knitting together of a joint. I had already read that sentence. Let me carry on from there. But even in spiritual things, let nothing changeable that may have occurred to the mind be thought of God. For when we aspire to that height from this depth, it is a step toward no small bit of knowledge if, before we can know what God is, we can already know what he is not. Let me pause there. So we've got this idea of the Trinity that he's putting on the table, and um, which is certainly different from uh, an idea that you, of the cosmos uh, or vices or natura that you're going to get in, in other traditions. And he wants to emphasize this idea of negation. Note that he uses negation in the very way that he sets up the good. He says, it is a step toward no small bit of knowledge. So that's a, that's a positive thing, right? There's a, there's a degree of knowledge, but he uses a negation to access that. So somehow negation is related to a kind of knowing. So there's paradox in this negation. But just to stick with the notion of negation, that we we don't know uh, the Trinity, that it is other from our categories. He then uses a long series of negations, not just in one sentence, but notice the notice the negations in the rest of that paragraph. For assuredly, he is neither heaven nor earth, nor like heaven and like earth and heaven, nor any such thing as we see in the heaven nor any such thing as we do not see and is perhaps in the heaven even if by the power of your imagination you magnify the light of the sun in your mind as much as you are able either that it be may be greater or that it may be brighter a thousand times as much or innumerable times yet even this is not god neither as the pure angels are thought of as animating heavenly bodies, changing and making use of them in accordance with the will by which they serve God, neither if all were brought together and became one, etc., etc. Nor would it be so even if you were to think of these same spirits without bodies, which is indeed extremely difficult for our carnal thought. <laughs> yes, but even if you could think it, no, that would not be God either. So rhetorically, what he does is he uses a long series of negations to emphasize, to undergird the notion of uh, the unknowability of God. Let me just draw your attention to the, the footnote that's at the bottom of that page too, that this is not simply an Augustinian way of thinking. This is something that occupies other traditions as well. Moses Maimonides uh, is a medieval uh, Jewish philosopher. And just here's, I'll just read the footnote for you. The attempt to describe God by saying what God is not is called in later medieval philosophy, the negative way, the via negativa. Moses Maimonides says that even claims about God made in the affirmative mode should be understood as implicit denials. Okay, so this is a concept that, that can, be, uh, can be a bit tricky, can be a bit difficult, but it's something that I think that you, you want to wrap your, your mind around. Now, I have to pause because I need to collect my papers, which blew away in the wind. I'll be right back. Okay, you might note that what we've just been talking about, this idea of negation, poses a kind of a problem. Did you think of it? It poses a problem for the notion of the ontotheological synthesis. If it is true that the divine, the anthropic, and the natural realms are all connected, are all synthesized, how can we talk meaningfully about a God who is separate, who, who, who is separate from our categories, who, who is, is not the earth, is not heaven? 
what does this mean? Right? So if you think back to paragraph four on page three of the Dupre, you will note that Dupre hinted at this theme. He hinted that there was something different going on in the Hebrew and Christian traditions than what is represented in the Ionian, um, the Greek and the Roman traditions. But the emphasis then, and the emphasis I'll repeat now, is that somehow the Hebrew and the Christian traditions do belong to those others, do share the notion of the ontotheological synthesis. So how can this how can this be? How do we make how do we make sense of it? It's a great question. Let's look for a little bit of an answer to book eight, chapter three, and subsection five. There would therefore be no changeable goods unless there were an unchangeable good. When you hear then of this good and that good, which may not even be good in other respects, if it were possible to put aside those goods, which are good by a participation in the good and see the good itself, of which they are good by participation. For when you hear of this or that good, you also understand the good itself at the same time. If, therefore, I repeat, you could put these goods aside and perceive the good in itself, you would see God. So Augustine thinks that participation is, is true. Is, he belongs to this, this worldview, this outlook. And yet he builds in the notion of separability. So somehow for him, these two things are reconcilable. And this is one of the places where it really does become practical to think, okay, I'm not sure that I get this, but I'm not going to put the emphasis on whether he has proven his point or trying to kind of reason this through before I go on any further. We have to inhabit his prose. And what we want is an awareness of what he is holding together, whether or not we, we, can, fully, we can fully make sense of that. So one of the things that I will say, though, is that what Augustine does here is he gives something to the Western tradition that is very important, and that, that is a different understanding of freedom. Because in the ontotheological synthesis, if the divine, the anthropic, and the natural realms are all connected, then there is no, no room for maneuver. There is no separability between the realms. And yet for Augustine, somehow there is. And so the notion of that separability within a participatory ontological framework allows one greater scope for imagining things being themselves. One of the beneficiaries of this is science. Because one of the principles of science is that it is possible to isolate an, uh, an element and to see how it behaves under a Bunsen burner or over a Bunsen burner, uh, for, for example, and we can make ob observations. That gets tricky, for instance, in the realm of the quantum, where we realize that uh, when we observe something, we change the way that it, that, that it behaves. But it is part and parcel of the development of science uh, that we recognize that we, we do have a measure of an ability for observation and detachment. Similarly, the idea of political autonomy depends on this Augustinian notion of separability, freedom. So there's something here that we absolutely want, but we also want the notion of participation that Augustine himself is, is preserving along with the Ionian, the Greek, and the Roman traditions. So a little tricky, uh, but it's something that we want to work. Uh, we want to work with. Okay. Speaking of paradox, 
Next rhetorical point. Speaking of paradox, note that he has no problem invoking authority. So his notion of freedom, um, his notion of separability um, does not hold him back from appealing to authority. So let's just notice too that that is, of course, a rhetorical strategy. To the, the, the authority that I'm thinking of here is scriptures. Just notice in 8, 4, 6, how he suddenly appeals to all kinds of different scriptures to support the point that he's trying to make. So he invokes the scriptures as a kind of authority. It's a rhetorical move. Do we agree with it? Do we in our present time think that one, you know, that one wants to one wants to do that, that that's effective? You know, opinions will differ, right? But uh, simply to appeal to, to, to authority, we use foot, footnotes in our essays, for example, is part and parcel of how uh, rhetoric works. There are three other things that I want to say before I finish this little mini lecture on books eight and nine. So you can see what I'm doing here, right? I'm just using a few examples of rhetoric, and I invite you to do the same in your in your journal entries. Just seize on one that you think, oh, here's an example of negation. Now that, that's interesting. And what do I what do I like about that, or what do I think is interesting about that? And just you know, just engage in a little thought experiment. Um, you don't have to do much for these journal entries, really. They're not meant to be onerous exercises. They're meant to help you engage in the text and uh, inhabit uh, Augustine's thought world. Okay, so these three other things. One, note the slender hints at a theme, the theme of the inner word. This is going to absolutely occupy us in weeks. I think it's five and six thereabouts. And I just in passing want you to be aware of, of the way that he starts to drip feed uh, this theme. For instance, go back to the preface, what's called the preface of uh, book eight. And uh, the, the bit that I want is right at the bottom of page four. And he says this, therefore, insofar as the creator himself in his marvelous mercy comes to our help, let us turn our attention to these subjects which we shall analyze in a more inward way than the preceding things. He's already been talking for seven books worth, and he's going to up the ante now. He's going to keep talking about nature, where he finds lots of examples of the good, and then he's going to talk about ideas related to inter interiority, uh, memory, for example, and reflection, and ideas of the self. Uh, these are all these are the beginnings of modern psychology in, in fact and uh it is uh, widely accepted that augustine gives us the first philosophy of mind uh in this text so these are all things that are knowable and he's going to push us uh towards the limits of our understanding but he's interested in a lot of different forms of what we can know and he's talking about these things he's in, increasingly in terms of this notion of the inner word. So here we just get that, we get an idea of interiority, seeking the inner part of things. If you look a little bit further on in book eight, chapter six, section nine or subsection nine, this is on page 16. This is, a, this is one of those long chapters. There aren't this long but this is a long chapter so on page 16 right at the top of the page he says um, he's talking about thinking about Carthage uh, or Alexandria and having an image in our mind of uh, a city that we might not even have visited yet uh, and he says so in accordance with the description that could be given me I formed an image of it in my mind as I was able and this is its word within me. So just note this in passing, uh, that we, we, we develop an idea of something and uh, uh, something speak to us, speaks to us from, with, from within. This is its word within me. So the word uh, belongs to, in this case, Alexandria. 
and it is at the same time uh, within me. And then in uh, book nine, uh, chapter seven, section 12, very short chapter, and it's all about this inner word. He says, the true knowledge of things thence conceived, we bear with us as a word and beget by speaking from within, nor does it depart from us by being born. And right at the end of that, for no one willingly does anything which he has not spoken previously in his heart. So the notion of the inner word is articulated a little bit more here, and it's connected with the notion of the heart. So these are just three little tidbits that he gives us here and I want you to if you can pay attention to the development of this theme throughout it's as I say it's going to occupy us especially when we get to book 15 uh, and that's the first thing of this first a little additional note that I wanted you to pay attention to one the, the hints of the theme is inner word second one the entanglement of love and knowledge it's there already in that phrase a word of the heart if a word is something that we know and yet it's in the heart there's some kind of a connection between um, knowledge or intellect on the one hand and emotion or heart on the other. And I'll, I'll just remind you of another place where he develops this theme earlier in chapter eight, sorry, book eight, chapter four, section six, uh, where he says, this is on page 10, where he says right at the top of the page, uh, unless we love him now, we shall never see him. But who loves that which he does not know? He's striking at another paradox here. How do you love something that you don't know? Which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Which comes first, knowledge or love? And there's an entanglement here that he is, uh, that he's just announcing. Third little additional thing. And I just love this. In, at the beginning of book nine, again, this is, a, I think, something that you might want to underline and use uh, as a reminder as you read your way through Augustine and as you think about the notion of ontological participation or the ontotheological synthesis. Um, he says, and this is um, 911 on page 24 let us then towards the bottom let us then be of this mind so as to know that the inclination to seek the truth is safer than the presumption which regards unknown things as known let us therefore so seek as if we were about to find and so find as if we were about to seek rhetorically there's a kind of paradox there uh, there's certainly a kind of chiasm um, which is a kind of rhetorical technique. And it's also something that derives from a participatory understanding. You can know things. Things are knowable. We can find things. We're not just groping in the dark. But we don't find in a way that gives us totalizing knowledge. Let us so find as if we were about to seek and so seek as if we're about to find. We need to seek in such a way with the hope that we can find, that it is realistic, that we're not just spinning our wheels or making it up, which will lead to the rhetorical uh, um, belief that we can bullshit, that we can bullshit our way through things, right? That, that's not Augustine. Let us so seek as if we're about to find, finding is possible but so find in a way that we don't think that we then have something and can manipulate it and control it, which would lead to things like, you know, say, um, uh, arrogance and cockiness in the way that we environmentally treat the world around us, right? If we think that, well, we, we've got this, we've, we, we know it, we've figured it out, uh, we know how to put oil on a tanker and we can do that with impunity and that leads to accidents like the Exxon Valdez incident in Alaska a long, long time ago. Um, Okay, uh, those are the three, 
three little additional points that I wanted to to add, and uh, that's um, that's an example of how I want you to be engaging uh, in your your reading of on the Trinity. Again, just uh, just take one or two uh, little things, but there's lots to choose from uh, rhetorically and intellectually. All right, okay, I'll stop it there. Bye, bye, bye.